Can we, in some <coughs> sense, see uh, the possibility for uh, a kind of agrarian vision moving forward in our society? Um, I think that many of the things that are happening um, are, uh, in, are people, are in some sense, reaching back to and feeling some animation of the way in which uh, agriculture was thought to be so fundamental uh, to uh, the fate of our society. Right? Maybe that's nostalgia, but, or maybe there are ways in which we can actually think about our food system animating our lives uh, in ways that would give us a sense of who we are and where we're going. Um, but I think that uh, there is, in some sense, um, also uh, a, a deep conflict uh, that's emerged here between these two philosophies of agriculture. Uh, that oftentimes, farmers and many of us find ourselves in a tension here with respect to these philosophies of agriculture. But if we take uh, water, right? Uh, traditionally, farms have had a very favored status with respect to both access to water and use of water uh, and uh, um, not you know, necessarily been held to account in the same way that uh, you know, somebody who's operating a factory might be held to account in terms of uh, how they uh, dispose of their wastes and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think that, again, uh, is part of the inheritance of uh, Lincoln and Jefferson's vision that agriculture has a special role to play. Uh, agriculture is bedrock. And, you know, we need to support farmers, right? We, we need to give them uh, some, some support. Uh, on the other hand, if you think that agriculture is just another sector of the industrial economy, then, you know, farms are going to be treated the same way as any potential polluter, right? You know, just like, you know, that factory down the street or that gas station, right? I would say, you know, the, one of the primary pushes that we experience to regulate agriculture today <coughs> It derives from this industrial philosophy of agriculture. You may specify that philosophy in relatively more conservative terms or in more what we call liberal terms. You may have different views about the role of government. But, you know, you see agriculture as a firm in an industrial economy. Uh, and this is going to get you to uh, this idea that, uh, uh, you know, that's how we should think about agriculture. It's very commonplace for people who uh, do not play, do not work in the food economy. Um, it's kind of natural that you might think of agriculture as just another sector of the economy, but it's also a vision that is being pretty actively promoted by many farmers and farm organizations today. Um, and I want to suggest that uh, people both within and outside farming and agriculture are, are increasingly caught in the tensions between these two contending philosophies of agriculture. And they, they set up incompatible <coughs> expectations. They, they, on the one hand, we want to help farmers, we want to favor farmers. On the other hand, farmers are no different than anybody else, right? Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, both creates burdens for farmers, and it also uh, keeps them from realizing certain opportunities that they might have uh, if they're thought of as uh, special. So my suggestion here is that getting a handle on some of these tensions may be the first step. Uh, and that's what I mean by a practical tool for helping us think and talk about how ideas shape the world in which we work and act. That conflict and that tension is so there. And it's so there. I see in the one thing I was just <coughs> mentioning to my husband was um, because in that special category, in the ag sector category, there are people who think they're special within both categories. And we see that tension that that when, and I think, I feel like personally it has to do with when agriculture became sectorized into soybeans and corn and beef and, and um, hogs, that we were never together again as a whole, as agriculture. We all had our different piece that we were taking care of. And, and I think that tension built through that, that those times and then as we've learned what types of, as we've progressed in the use of, of chemicals and um, practices of technology, uh, it's become a bigger divide. Uh, the most fervent, and I hope the most conspicuous aspect of our farm um, has been environmentalism. Uh, so as I try to associate that with Dr. Thomas, Thompson's uh, 
uh, contrasting uh, conceptions of agriculture. Uh, I, I, I'm not able to. Re I'm, I'm able to res resonate with hardly anything uh, on the uh, the industrial side, but regarding the uh, agrarian side, there are some twists in his conception, and uh, I, I need to think further and, and listen further uh, to uh, decide uh, just exactly how a, 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 an environmentally uh, centered uh, agricultural system uh, fits in that second conception. Um, technology is incredible, and especially, um, I mean, when we started out organically farming in the 70s, to find anyone who was doing the same sort of thing as we were was, you know, was almost unheard of. And um, <coughs> now I have a problem in the field, and I can take a picture of it, and I can send it to, you know, Iowa State or you know, Maryland or Vermont or wherever. And get an answer back, just and, and it just blows me away that I can do this. I can also use technology as marketing, as a marketing tool, and, and use all of that. And I, I think David said was is really um, right on saying talking about pro appropriate use. I think one thing I see in my career of farming is that um, my neighbors and that have just about embraced every kind of technology and and everything saying that they're being progressive farmers and I always have held a little bit back saying appropriateness, <coughs> there's appropriate technology and um, to question whether or not we, really, we need it. Maybe our neighbor needs it but maybe we don't but um, there's a lot of peer pressure in farm country about having the same tools and building up for you know what, what everybody has. So I think a lot of times farmers may not question the appropriateness or the uh, application of it in the way we should. I think hard and a lot about how to <clears throat> um, come up with the most positive environmental impact uh, uh, of the way I farm. And it seldom occurs to me to, to even give thought to technology as I pursue that subject. But alas, uh, I, I resolved this spring to uh, try to use the internet to help me to have a deeper understanding of a particular, particularly difficult uh, weed uh, problem that I have. So uh, perhaps I like uh, Rip Van Winkle and waking me from a great slumber. <laughs> As a food producer, I think my our my role in climate change is to bring back food production, actual um, people. <coughs> Uh, cons consumption of my food when the, when the other parts of the country collapse without any water. I mean, we all depend on 90% of food that comes into Iowa is imported. 90% of our food that comes into the state is, you know, is consumed in our state. So we have a lot of ways to go, which some people think is going back because we used to produce before the 1940s. We produced most of our food in the state, and and so we, because of the change in agriculture, um, so I'm part of a, a you know a, a group of people that's bringing back food production to be in a localized area, so that we don't depend on fossil food so much, and that we have healthy, good, nutritious food that's raised closely at home that has more nutrient value to it. The main factor that I see that we've lost. To to be more resilient is the organic matter in our soils. It's, it's drastically gone down from, you know, Louisiana purchase days to today, certainly, and, and especially probably in the last 100 years. And, uh, some of the new technology could, could help to enhance that, such as like no-till. I'm not a no-till person. Being organic, I haven't quite mastered that yet, although there is some pretty interesting research on no-till organic. but. Uh, uh, just trying to not just maintain our soils, but trying to rebuild our soils, which it's a lot harder to rebuild soils than, than the easiness in which it was to tear them apart over the last 100, 200 years. But, uh, As we know that vegetable farmers also uh, contribute to carbon in the, in the <clears throat> air because we till a lot. And so it's one of those things, how can we keep um, our ground cover on? How can we keep cover crops on? and not be killing so much for those weeds that we're trying to get rid of. And so it's always about 
finding different techniques and maybe technologies in that in order to keep the carbon in the soil. Uh, just this morning on NPR, we were uh, talking about on uh, the morning edition that there was a discussion of implications of, of population increase for uh, uh, transportation in urban areas. And they began the, the thing by, by the, the projecting that in 2045 it would be as difficult to commute in Omaha. Well, they said Omaha would be the new Los Angeles. Well, where does that leave my humble organic farm <laughs> 25 minutes away? I, I guess, I think we'll probably everybody, anybody who cared enough about agriculture to, to come to this today has awareness of and thoughts about sprawl. I, I guess I just want to say that as I try to understand it and project what's going to happen, uh, it's hard to identify any uh, uh, sources of pushback against sprawl. I mean, everybody seems to have a vested interest in it or to be uh, sort of indifferent to it. Uh, I noticed in this last, last election, a lot of the local politicians' best ideas for being elected uh, was moving uh, economic development as fast as possible down Highway 50. Uh, it, I, I just don't, uh, I don't see any constituency for, for pushback. I think that the, the around Omaha, Lincoln, Des Moines, all of these places that, that people, it's, <laughs> land is a commodity and it's used as development, and there has to be means to, to take that out of that equation. So our whole farm's called Roseman Family Farms, and then our little smaller, little acreage where our vegetables and our eggs come from is called Pinot Place. And the reason why we named it Pinot Place is because uh, Daniel's grandfather planted the Pinocs around our farm. So every time you look at him, you're like, he did that for us. So we want to make sure that every decision in, that we make and any enterprise that we add is for our grandchildren. And we have a two-year-old. So, you know, that's a long way, sorry. Um, but, and just every, every decision we make on our farm has an implication. And so um, those are the kind of, that's who we're responsible to as the next generation. But I feel very strongly about this, that the farmers have a very strong moral base to raise food to feed the world. Now, maybe we'll disagree on whether or not we feed the world and could have a long philosophical argument about that. But um, I, I, there's, I think farmers are farming, I like to think this, that they're farming to, you know, because they have a moral obligation to farm in a lot of ways, and, and probably I'm being a little idealistic about that. One of the things that's uh, encouraging about some of the new consumer interests is frankly just that they're taking much more interest in the food system. I mean, I think that's positive. Um, and, and one of the things that I think is uh, uh, important when it's possible, and I realize it's not always possible, but is that when you're um, responding to consumer concerns when you're, or, or consumer interests, trying to give them things they want, um, if you can use that as an opportunity to pull people a little deeper into understanding what's going on in food, agriculture, and environment. One of the things that uh, I do think is important about a more agrarian way of thinking is that I think um, the engagement that the average person has with their food can be a way in which they can be brought to see um, and understand these more comprehensive system level questions about the sustainability of our environment. Um, you know, it's a way that you can actually get somebody to actually think about something like soil matter. The, the, the thing that we really try to encourage <coughs> is to get people a little deeper than just a preference for what they want to eat um, and to actually think about you know, what the larger consequences and the difficulties that are faced with meeting some of these kinds of preferences. And so it's, it's just a way to kind of, you know, it is a way that I think agriculture could, you know, in, much, in a way that's not the same as in Jefferson's time, but it's a way in which agriculture could become a kind of foundation for a more sustainable society. Um, you know, I don't think we're ever going to get back to, you know, 60% of the population farming. I'm not sure that's a good idea.
but uh, um, if we got to a situation where a larger percentage of people had some had the kind of appreciation that of the effect of farming on the, the broader environment that all the people up here seem to have, that would be a real positive uh, change that I think would be a way in which we'd be kind of revitalizing a kind of agrarian understanding of whatever.